ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا تقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس تقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا تقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله واحسن الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله if you look into the reasons that people accept islam or convert to islam and islam is the fastest growing religion in north america and in the world you will find that the majority of the time the thing that attracts people to islam is none other than tawhid tawhid stands out in a world of confusion and in a world where guidance has been lost because all of the alternatives to tawhid are either nonsensical or they lead down to a very very destructive path the first alternative to tawhid is to believe that there is nothing at all that there is no god whatsoever that there's nothing beyond the material world just atoms and neurons and energy and the things that you study in physics class but this is an extremely unsatisfying explanation for everything that we see whether it's the existence of ourselves or the existence of all the beauty that we see around us and all of the order and all of the complexity how delicious the food is how beautiful it is to fall in love none of these things can be explained by simply referring to atoms and chemistry and physics allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says in the quran am khuliqu min ghayri shay'in am hum al khaliqun or were they created by nothing or were they the creators of themselves allah subhanahu wa ta'ala draws our attention to a contradiction here it can't be both ways either you have to come about from something or you have to have just come about from nothing and we know that that's not possible so if you come from something who created you what's responsible for the fact that you exist it contradicts everything that we know about reality and human life to imagine that we did not come from a creator if you walk on the street and you see a car parked on the side of the road and maybe that car is illegally parked and maybe it's about to get a ticket and maybe that's your car the police officer they're about to write a parking ticket and they say who's the owner of this car and you say there is no owner to this car the car just came about just like that right there on the spot right there on the street he would probably haul you and put you into a mental institution because the existence of a car indicates that somebody put it there the just like the existence of a watch or the existence of a building indicates that there was somebody who made it brothers and sisters look inside of your own selves like allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that there are signs in the creation around us and within our own selves if you look down at the biological level if you look at the sociological level there are signs and signs and signs how did it possibly get here how can we believe that the machines that we use every single day we take it for granted that steve jobs made the iphone or that bill gates made the microsoft and then somehow when it comes to human beings or it comes to the heavens and the earth it comes to the cells it comes to the trees it's a debate all of a sudden now we have to go into these long involved arguments and proofs no no people are running away from responsibility the things that you believe in they're not neutral there is no neutral ground the things that you believe in have consequences to believe that we came from nothing 
to believe that no one is responsible for our existence here on earth, it means that we don't believe in purpose to human life. It means that we don't believe in any duty between me and you as human beings or between mother and son or father and daughter. It means that we don't believe in any concrete idea of what is good. If nothing is responsible for bringing us here, then it's just me filling my belly and you filling your belly, and hopefully we don't come into conflict that we have to fight each other over it. It's the belief, this is the belief of the people who want to live without limits. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us out in the Quran. All of the arguments, all of the posturing, all of the making it seem like this is reasonable and rational and scientific at the base of it. That's not what it is. At the base of it, it's that people want to live without limits. And the easiest way to justify living without limits is to deny that there's going to be any accountability in the afterlife. Tawheed gives people purpose. And that's why people come from atheism to Islam. Because Tawheed gives people purpose. It tells you that your life has value. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't do things randomly. He doesn't do things without purpose. He doesn't do things without meaning. And so if you exist, if you're sitting right now listening to this khutbah, that means that you have value. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala determined that you were valuable enough to create and valuable enough to bring into existence. And one life who believes that he has purpose is not the same as somebody who believes that they do not have purpose. Tawheed gives us direction. Tawheed gives us meaning. And Tawheed gives us structure. But believing in nothing at all is not the only alternative to Tawheed. Because if it was, then the Quraysh would never have needed a prophet at all. Because the Quraysh did not believe in nothing. The Quraysh believed in something. They even believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they believed in idols. They believed in angels. Not in the way that we believe in angels. They believed that angels were the daughters of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They believed that there were these other beings that you could pray to, that you could worship, that would help you out and help you get closer to worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the next, if somebody accepts that there must be something out there, there must be something beyond this material world, something that's responsible, the next question that they have to answer is, well, is it multiple or is it singular? Is it one God or is it multiple gods? Now, if there had been two or more gods and those gods had equal power, then they would have eventually come into conflict. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this in the Quran. Lo kana fihima alihatun illallah la fasadata. Fa subhanallah rabbil arshi amma yasifun. Had there been within the heavens and the earth gods besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they both, meaning both the heavens and the earth, would have been ruined. So exalted is the Lord, Lord of the throne, above what they describe. Imagine leaving two of your children at home in the kitchen for an hour or two hours or three hours unsupervised. They might get along at first, but then what's going to happen? One of them wants to do something. The other one wants to do the other thing. They start to conflict. They start to fight. They start to argue. They start to tussle back and forth with each other. Next thing you know, you come back in and the whole kitchen's a mess. The flour and the milk and the butter's everywhere all over the floor and up the walls. The same would happen, the same would happen even at the level of divinity if there were more than one God. One God wants the night to be dark and the other one wants the night to be light. Well, then we would see some sort of evidence of this conflict in the earth, which we do not if there were lesser gods, so imagining that there are two or more gods of equal status, that's one way to do it. The other way is more like the Quraysh, to imagine that there is one god at the top, but then underneath of God are all of these intermediaries, all of these partners and associates that will get us closer to Allah. Now the first the first refutation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about this is that if that were true, if that were true, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have told us about it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِهِ 
إلا أسماء سميتموها أنتم وآباؤكم ما أنزل الله بها من سلطان إن الحكم إلا لله أمر ألا تعبدوا إلا إياه ذلك الدين القيم ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون You worship not besides him except just names Names that you've invented yourself Names that you came up with yourself you and your fathers besides you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never sent any evidence. He never sent any authority or warrant to justify worshipping these names. Legislation is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And Allah azza wa jal has commanded that you do not worship anything except for Him. That is the correct religion, but most people, they don't know. If there had been any way to approach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through an associate or through an intermediary or through a saint or through an angel, then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would have told us about it as well. But what do we find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكْ مِنْ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا فَعْبُدُونَ And we sent not before you any messenger Except that we revealed to him that there is no God except me, so worship me. That there is no deity except me, so worship me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that when all the prophets and messengers are gathered on the day of judgment, those who claimed that Jesus, the son of Mary, taught people to worship him, then we're going to have an expose. We're going to have an interrogation. And and Isa alayhi salam is going to free himself from all of what people claimed. وَإِذْ قَالَ اللَّهُ يَا عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمْ أَأَنْتَ قُلْتَ لِلنَّاسِ اتَّخِذُونِي وَأُمِّيَ إِلَى هَيْنِ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ قَالَ سُبْحَانَكَ مَا يَكُونُ لِي أَنْ أَقُولَ مَا لَيْسَ لِي بِحَقِّ إِنْ كُنْتُ قُلْتُهُ فَقَدْ عَلِمْتَهِ تَعْلَمُ مَا فِي نَفْسِي وَلَا أَعْلَمُ مَا فِي نَفْسِكْ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ عَلَّامُ الْغُيُوبَ Beware, watch out for the day when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to Jesus, O oh Jesus, son of Mary, did you tell people, take me and my mother as gods besides Allah? Isa ibn Maryam will say, Subhana, exalted be you. It was not for me to say that that to which I have no right to say. And if I had said it, then you would have known about it. You know what is in myself, and I do not know what is within yourself. Indeed, it is you who are the knower of the unseen. ما قلت لهم إلا ما أمرتني به أن يعبدوا الله ربي وربكم وكنت عليهم شهيدا ما دمت فيهم فلما توفيتني كنت أنت الرقيب عليهم وأنت على كل شيء شهيد. Isa will say, I did not say to them anything except what you told me to say, to worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. And I was a witness and re responsible for them as long as I was with them. But once you took me up, once you took me away from them, then you were the watcher over them and you are over all things witness. One time when I was in Medina, I was walking around Sayyid al-Shuhada near Jabal Uhud. Those who have been to Medina, they know the place. And we were sitting there, me and a couple of classmates, we were drinking tea. And there was someone who came up to us and he noticed because we looked like students of the Islamic University. So he had a question. And he said, many people in my homeland, they say that I cannot worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly, that I have to go through another means. I have to go through a saint or I have to go through the wali or I have to go through this other sort of way. Because Allah is like a king, and you cannot approach the king by yourself. You have to go through his guards, you have to go through his messengers, you have to go through security first. And so I said to him, why does the king need his guards? And why does the king need his security entourage? And why does the king need his spies, and need his messengers, and need all of his posse? Because the king is weak. The king can't do it all by himself. The king can't be in all places at once or know what's going on in all things in his kingdom at once. 
The king can't talk to multiple people at once or hear more than one voice at one time. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears the dua of every single one of you in every single language that you could possibly make it in at the same time and he can answer it in the same instance and it doesn't even fatigue him. It doesn't even make him tired. It's not even an effort for him at all subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-ghani. He does not need anything. He doesn't even need our worship. This is one of the biggest mistakes that we make. We think that we're doing Allah a favor through worshiping Him, Subhana. We're only doing ourselves a favor. And if we leave worship, if we miss the prayers, or if we miss our fast, or if we miss anything, we're not hurting Him whatsoever. And we're not hurting Islam whatsoever. We're only hurting ourselves. We're only oppressing ourselves. And we're only hurting our afterlife. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran, in Surah Luqman, that shirk, worshipping anything besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is dhulmin azim, is oppression, great oppression, the greatest oppression that could exist. And the first time many people, they read this ayah, they're very confused. Because when you think of oppression, and I think of oppression, we don't think of idolatry first. We think about politics, we think about Palestine, we think about uh, racism in the United States, we think about all of these other issues that are synonymous with oppression. So how is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that the greatest oppression of all is the oppression of shirk, is the oppression of worshipping something other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Well, I would challenge any one of you to follow around someone who worships other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Follow them around for a day. Follow them around for two days. Follow them around for a week and you will see the oppression that they live under. They don't know if they're coming or going. They don't know if the jinn or the angels or the forces or the ancestors or the zodiacs or the crystals are for them, against them. They want to get something such as a job or such as a spouse or such as a child, and they don't even know how to get, about to get what they want. And then if they do something arbitrary, stepping on a crack, walking under a ladder, breaking glass, something like this, it's as if they ruin their whole lives in this life and the next. What can be more oppressive than to not know the rules of the game? What could be more oppressive to not know where you stand with your sustainer, Subhana? What could be more oppressive than to not know where you're going to end up on the day of judgment? This is the oppression of shirk, putting powers to things that have no powers, taking the might and the worship that is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and putting it into something that is useless that cannot even defend itself, let alone defend you. To believe in Tawheed, to believe in Tawheed means to believe in focus. It means to believe in focus as opposed to confusion. It means to believe in clarity over confusion. And it means to believe in submission over control. <clears throat> the name of our religion is submission. And when it comes to idol worship, Somebody has to speak for the idol at the end of the day. Because the idol cannot speak for itself. The idol, if it makes requests of you, it says it needs some sort of sacrifice or needs some sort of act of obedience out of you, somebody has to speak for it. Who's that going to be? Somebody who puts themselves up in that position. And you can bet yourself. You can bet that there's going to be a conflict of interest and they're going to have you serving them as opposed to serving this so-called idol. Submission is the name of our deen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the guidance clearly for us to submit, not to try to reassert our control over it by introducing middlemen or intermediaries or associates with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is something that takes us far away from tawheed. Alhamdulillahi ala ihsani, wa shukalahu ala tawfiqihi wa amtinani, wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wa ahtuhu la sharika lah, ta'zeeman li sha'ni wa ashadu anna nabiyyana wa sayyidina muhammadana abduhu wa rasooluhu wa da'i ila rudwani, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa ikhwani wa sallimu tasliman kathira. To believe in tawheed is not just about to believe in Allah's oneness. 
We talked in the beginning about a choice to believe in something or to believe in nothing. Well, once you've chosen to believe in something, <clears throat> then we said that the next choice was to believe in one or to believe in many, to believe in a singular God or to believe in a multiple God. And so we've concluded that the singular wins out. Well, there's one item left up for analysis, and that is about who is this God? We've decided that he exists. We've concluded that he is one. But who is he really? What is the substance? What is the actual character of that being that we worship? Because the last alternative to Tawheed that exists is to believe in a distant God. To believe in a God that merely started everything, pressed the button, <coughs> pressed the start button, and walked away. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا سَالَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّعِي لَا دَعَانٌ فَاسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ And when my servants ask you, O Muhammad, about me, tell them, indeed, I am near. I respond to the prayer of the supplicant when he calls upon me. <clears throat> so let them respond to me with obedience and believe in me so that they may, might be rightly guided. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about himself in the Qur'an. And Allah azza wa jal has the most right to inform us about himself. And the thing that he tells us over and over and over again is that he is responsive. He is not a distant God that doesn't care about you and your problems. He is not a distant God who is impartial to what you do. Just standing back and letting everything just take place and let the chips fall where they may. No, he cares about you. He is al-wadud. He loves you. And he loved you enough to guide you to Islam and to bring you upon this straight path. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ مُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَتِي سَيَدْخُلُونَ جَهَنَّمَ دَاخِرِينَ And your Lord says, call upon me. If you do, I will respond to you. Indeed, those who turn away from my worship will enter the hellfire contemptible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleading to you to call out to him. He's begging you to call out to him, not because he needs it, but because you need it. And this is another trap that we fall into. Sometimes we feel shy. We're too used to asking people. If I go up, I guarantee you, if I go up to you today, it's Friday, it's Juma, and I ask for $5. You might think it's strange when you say, okay, the Imam needs $5. Here's $5. And I come to you Saturday and I say, hey, can I have another $5? And now you're alerted, this is, this is not normal, but you might give me a $5, maybe you like me. If I keep on going to you day after day, there's going to come a day where you say, hey, what's going on here? Stop asking me for money. Hey, what's going on? I don't, I'm not comfortable. Stop asking me for these things. And so we expect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the same. We ask for mercy. We ask for forgiveness. We ask for health. We ask for success. We ask for protection. And at a certain point, we might start to feel shy. You might start to wonder, well, I've already asked for so much, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not like you or me. He's not like a human being. Because when we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are admitting our desperate need for Him. We're admitting the fact that we're hopeless without Him, that we depend so utterly on His favor and on His decree. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually loves it. He actually loves that we ask more and more and more. And he would dislike it if we stopped asking. So don't fall prey to this waswas. Don't fall prey to this shubha, to this doubt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves that you ask because he loves you. He loves that you ask because he loves to fulfill your need. He loves that you ask because he loves to see that you depend upon him and trust him so much. So to believe in this God, this God, this is Allah. This is Tawheed. To believe in Tawheed is to believe in clarity over confusion, as we said, but it's also to believe in mercy. It's to believe in mercy and to believe in love. That is the God of Islam. That is Allah. And that is Tawheed.